No one knew why the coup d'etat was, and we had one, one month before we were to have national elections, but this is the coup d'etat, and essentially, uh, why did you do it? And the CIA, uh, and that's a fact, the CIA uh, approached another general, Pierre Bresson, whatever his name is there, to do a coup d'etat, he didn't want to do it. They went to see Batista, then went back to Batista the second time around. Batista was running out of money. Police patrol excited crowds in Havana who found that while they slept, behind the scenes strongman General Batista had overthrown the constitutional regime of President Carlos Prio. Now as then, his co-conspirators in the army, navy and police seized key points. The present coup was accomplished in only 77 minutes, but Cuba's political freedom is ended as Batista cancels the June 1st elections. I mean, you become president, you have the salary, you're great. Okay. So uh, he agreed to do the coup d'etat. The question, why would you do a coup d'etat? Well, essentially, there is an orthodox party in Cuba, there in the book. It's a liberal party like let's say here, the, uh, uh, the Democratic Party, that, uh, that we have a United States Senator, that is a Marxist, you know, the one in Vermont, and we have a couple of representatives that are Marxists, the one in New York, another one, they are Marxist Lenins. <laughs> you see, that the Orthodox Party was like that. I have said very clear that we are not communists. Very clear. Porque hay que decir que por encima de todos, de todos, somos marxistas, leninistas. Castro was a member of that, was a young member of the, of the party, you see. So he says he's a liberal, but he's actually a radical. Uh, uh, at that time, you see. So, so basically, the CIA, for whatever reason, didn't want that. And another reason was that Cuba was uh, investing Cubans in rice, who used to buy, in those days, like $70 million a year in rice from Louisiana. Cuba is the, is the country outside of the Orient that eats the most amount of rice. There is no hard proof, but the, there was a senator from Louisiana called Ellender that uh, people say that he put pressure on the, uh, on the CIA to, to have to, what the real reason for having the coup d'etat. The following is a recording of a 1971 interview with Senator Ellender discussing his position as a president pro tempore of the Senate, having succeeded Richard Brevard Russell, the former governor of Georgia from 31 to 33, after which he served as senator for nearly 40 years. The theory that Mr. Rodriguez is suggesting is basically that Senator Ellender of Louisiana recognized a vital business tie with Cuba and was very friendly with former Governor Russell. Then Senator Russell would have no problem pulling strings, and a few years later he would find himself chair of the Armed Services Committee and the Appropriations Committee. The consequences are almost <laughs> the thermonuclear before night two because of that. Well, um, a couple questions I have for you. Um, what was your life like in Cuba prior to Castro? And I've read you were in the military and, and you witnessed an execution. No, 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 no. I was a student. You know, I was a student in Cuba until they 
And one day I went to a chemistry class and they were arresting students, they arrested me. And men, uh, they took me to jail. There must have been like 50 students uh, there. And most of them were uh, uh, humble background. And I was actually December the 6th, 1956, the birthday. And immediately my mother had cake and so on. And when I didn't come, they started looking and then they found out that I was in a, Arrested and then immediately my father called Triana, who is the head of police, and said, no, not so. They immediately released me, and I, I, I was sad because of the other students had to stay there two, three days. But after that, I became uh, part of the student revolutionary group. I was young, but uh, at that time I started throwing Molotov cocktails and things like that. I made out of gasoline, and then. Outside you put a little bit of cotton, and on the cotton you put alcohol, and then you ignite the alcohol when you throw it. And... I had the opportunity to meet Lee Harvey Oswald on four different times in New Orleans. The first time was when he tried to infiltrate the Cuban Student Directorate, that is the organization that I represent in New Orleans, Louisiana. And I believe that if he was working at that moment for the Fair Play for Cuba Committee, and he was trying to infiltrate one anti-Castro organization, it's obvious that he was working for somebody else at that moment, and that somebody else could not be anyone else than Fidel Castro. Triana told my father, he said, look, you need to take uh, your son out of here because he may get killed. So then I came to America in 57, and I was supposed to go to the woodwork camp. So they couldn't wait, so they sent me to North Carolina to Presbyterian school which my mother didn't like. I then switched later on to uh, the 12 miles from Charlotte to Belmont Abbey College which was a Catholic. My mother was happy. Castro was overthrown so I went back to Cuba and then I went to the military academy which was identical to West Point. I mean everything was uh, uh, everything I mean, identical. A copy was smaller you see. Well the, uh, before we go into uh, the academy in Cuba, I'm curious, what were the politics of the Student Revolutionary Directorate? Like, what were they talking about? What were the meetings like? Well, essentially the students were totally anti-Batista, you see, and they really wanted the 1940 Constitution and uh, revert the coup d'etat of Batista. Continue in Cuba, the way it was, and, uh, according to the United Nations, uh, the, the country there is more from 1900 to 1958 in the world was Cuban. Okay, so we have more TV, cars, and so on than most of the European countries. Uh, our world to decide, uh, communist world. Essentially, they wanted Cuba to continue progressing the way it was without having. Uh, I know I'm Castro was in the mountains, but he, he wasn't talking about Marxism, certainly. You know? But the Revolutionary Directorate wasn't really political. They just wanted to continue on the path they were. Right, but, 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 but basically the, the head, which by the way, he was, uh, Cheveria was in 1956, was president of the worldwide uh, head of uh, uh, universities uh, in Europe. You know. So he was fairly well known, you see. The president of the Revolutionary. Uh, uh, Chivalry, and he was... He was killed on March 13, 1957, when they decided to attack the presidential palace to do away with Batista. The fellow that took over was Chamon, which I met here in Miami, and uh, he told me at that moment, uh, I'll never forget, he said, well, probably the people of Cuba do not understand that if Castro were to be overthrown, the dictatorship of Batista would be nothing compared with the one he would and I thought that because they were enemies, I said, he's doing that, and my gosh. I mean, he knew that Castro was coming, and then when Castro, when he defeated us at the Bay of Pigs, on April 15, 1961, he declared himself a socialist. Porque hay que decir que por encima de todos, de todos, somos marxistas, leninistas. Um, I've read, and, and I'll ask you more about your time in the Bay of Pigs uh, later, but I'd like to talk about what happened before and after, that it was named after the membership number of a fighter who died. Right, in an accident in 
they had two or three people that die. Uh, two drowned in, in the Pacific that, that they sent us for two or three days to have you know, recreation and, and so on. And the Pacific is treacherous, it's not like the Atlantic, you know. The wave comes and so on, the two of them drowned, you see. So there was uh, talk, I think, three that died there. And a few that uh, that deserted, and uh, I, I, we surmise now that some of the one that deserted, Castro had put them in there because when we when we went to the Bay Fix, he knew, you know, how many people were in there and so on. Because he sent the only three planes that sent immediately, he sent it to fight officers. Were any men in Brigade 2506 left wing? Or did they believe that Castro had betrayed the revolution? When we got there, we had the young people, students and so on, and people like me that were pro-revolutionary, no communists, but, you know, in favor of the revolution. And then you have people that have been Batista followers and so on, and they were pro-Batista, in spite of women. So we did not get along. We, we really had some fights, uh, and those fights were over once we became prisoners. After that, there was no more Batista, no more uh, revolutionary. All of them were uh, together, you see. But before that, oh yeah, no, we had to... Well, what was the nature of the commanders? Were the commanders all revolutionaries? Well, no, the commanders, there was a mixture. A mixture of uh, junior officers of the regular Cuban army. And... Uh, the head San Roman was he had been arrested by Batista anyway, excellent person. Oliva the second of mine, a black fellow, became a major general in the American army and uh, he was instructed in Panama Canal. And then they had two or three civilians uh, that were, you know, college people that uh, in the headquarters, you see. So uh, but initially we had uh, a colonel from the Cuban army that opposed Batista coup d'etat. And we respected the man very much. And there was a fight one day that uh, some, of these, some of the people started criticizing and uh, then the, the head of the, our, our organization in Miami, the, the head of Tony Barone, who came he was, he was like a father to me later on. Uh, they backed us and said, no, we want uh, the general to be in charge. Two weeks afterward, he came back and they backtracked. No, 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 we, we don't want Martin Elena, that's his name. I was actually going to ask you about Elena. Martin Elena. And then uh, we surprised that the, the CIA wanted to doing Cuba, but they didn't wear the medal. So Martin Elena, do you think, would have been a better leader? Oh, no, right. He, he was a, a man in the 50s, you know, uh, serious. As a matter of fact, Martin Elena would not have allowed us to go the way we went. Colonel Martin Elena is an obscure figure in modern Bay of Pigs narratives, but it's important to point out how drastically things changed around him in Guatemala. He and his friend, Tony Verona, founded the Movement for the Recovery of the Revolution, also known as the MRR Party. Verona was the civilian head, also a supporter of Prio, who had the backing of the Traficante family. Martin Elena was his military counterpart, and the party drew the likes of Manuel Artime and Huber Matos, both active revolutionaries who were previously fighting alongside Castro and Che. All were revolutionaries who felt that they'd been betrayed, but all had different motives. To gain legitimacy, they founded the Democratic Revolutionary Front, or the FRD, a sort of exile political party. Its military wing was Brigade 2506, led, of course, by Martin Elena. Declassified documents reveal a close relationship between Gerald Droller and Elena. Droller, who helped orchestrate the coup in Guatemala, respected how apolitical yet motivated Elena was. It appears that there was a soft coup among brigade members, which resulted in his replacement with the more militant and political Manuel Artime.
A remarkable degree of solidarity was shown by Henry Rodriguez in this interview, but I could understand the feelings of resentment towards the CIA, feeling like you've been stabbed in the back by having your seasoned and apolitical commander replaced by the fiery and charismatic Artime only weeks before the invasion at the behest of a man who orchestrated the coup in Guatemala only years before. It was supposed to be a brigade, but the brigade was a battalion. The battalion were... were um Companies, the companies were platoon, platoon, were with, the, with the understanding that when we got to Cuba immediately, we would be, become, you see, like mine was, a, 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 a squad, a platoon, and then when I got to Cuba, I got four or five people immediately that, that uh, you know, get to our side, and, uh, you know, we wanted immediately to, uh, my squad to become platoon, and so on, you see. But anyway, uh, the, uh, the CIA... Uh, wanted to control Cuba, and the fellow asked me my opinion. And when I got there, and I saw those 500 people, and I just left 90 days before. Uh, Fernandez had taken half of us to a regiment in Matanzas, which is 80 miles from there, to train the officers of the militia. They start training 600 people in there, and they were that head of the union. They were no dog. And, uh, and the, he, the fellow asked me, he said, what's your opinion? He said, well, my opinion is that Fernandez, everybody knew Fernandez, because he had been in the army before. He was trained in Fort Sill, Oklahoma, and so on, a brilliant fellow, and director of the academy, anyway. So he said, well, my opinion is uh, the battalion of Fernandez has a battalion, we, we, they, we whipped the heck out of them. And then uh, the head of the battalion said, well, you're, he used the profanity, and I said, well, do you respect you, the one? That's my opinion, I think you are full of, full of it's yourself. I have misgivings, I ought to go, so these, I said, but, but then, then, here, here we are. The United States of America, they had never lost a war. How <laughs> can they lose one 90 miles away? I mean, yeah. you know see? So I saw that. I said, my gosh. And then they, they said, no, 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 we're going to wipe out uh, all their planes so we would have air. So our B-26 didn't have uh, uh, caliber pitching in the back. Because we didn't need it. See, oh, my gosh. But Castro still had a T-33 jet train. Right here, uh, Sea Fury, made right in England, and uh, B-26. So he sent a tree to shoot our ship. So the man knew everything. He had an excellent spy. So they they sunk to the supply, you see. And we were able to shoot down the B-26, but that T-33, I mean, every time our B-26 running there, they start shooting them down like that. And it got so bad that at the end, we had uh, three Americans get our pilots said, look, there's no way we're going to go there. We're going to be shooting down. And then they got there in their planes, and they were shooting down too. To explain the loss of Cuba, you need to know Jerry Droller. Journalists investigating the aftermath accused him of insane ambition. Like many in his shoes, Droller saw the Great Purge and grew disillusioned with communism and traveled to West Germany after the war, where he helped reconstruct the German army. It was in this capacity that he was noticed by the CIA, recruited, and sent to Formosa to build the army of Chiang Kai-shek. Pleased with his ability to build governments, the CIA wondered if he could topple them. Droller found himself in Guatemala in 1954 and was instrumental in the coup there. Finally, in 1960, the CIA decided to topple Castro and chose a unique new strategy. Droller was only a guiding hand for the FRD, and they did most of the work on their own. Within the FRD, the most influential group was the MRR Party, the Movement for Revolutionary Recovery. The leader of the MRR was Manuel Ar who in July 1960 expelled three executives from the panel, more or less making himself party president and establishing his own separate organization. From this point on, the history is mostly conjecture. Artime was a good man and acting in a way he thought was right 
as was Droller, who had told RTMA that he was in no way tied to the U.S. government, posing instead as a wealthy steel magnate interested in opening up lucrative businesses in Cuba. He also took the name Frank Bender, which is how he was known to most Cuban refugees. Bernard Macho Barker, who worked as a desk secretary for Jerry Droller, was approached by Manuel Artime, who made Macho a strange offer. If you get me close to Jerry, I'll pull some strings in a free Cuba and make you a sports car czar. This isn't as far-fetched as it sounds. In fact, Artime was well-connected, ambitious, and had a career in the Ministry of Agriculture with Castro's government before he left to form the MRR. Macho was also ambitious. In fact, he later joined the White House plumbers in the water Gate scandal, so Macho put in a good word about our teammate to his friend Droller. Around this time, the leadership of Martin Elena was called off and the training of his progressive officers curbed. Henry will say shortly that the airdrops to rebels in the mountains were called off weeks before the invasion. The final straw was the surprise formation of what was called the Cuban Revolutionary Council, which aimed to direct the actions of Brigade 2506 once they actually hit the beach. For added legitimacy, the CRC included Carlos Javier, who was president for under three days after Raymond Grau. The president of the CRC was to be Miro Cardona, who would be declared president of Cuba once the rebels had taken control of enough territory. Remember, however, the FRD was supposed to be a front group of five different exile organizations, all working together. Yet, in the months before the invasion, there seemed to be one soft coup after another. The CIA and Gary Droller had hoped to find popular support on the island, as Henry Rodriguez says, and see a rush to join. But groups like the FRD were being sidelined more and more. It wasn't even the CIA's intention to force the hand of JFK to send U.S. troops immediately, but to allow the brigade to declare a legitimate multi-party competitor government with control of key areas, which would be supported by other Caribbean nations, and Finally, if need be, U.S. troops. So you mentioned earlier in the interview that some people knew that Castro was a communist. I was speaking with someone who said that he was in Colombia in 1957. Oh, yes, I put it in the book, in 1948 in uh, well, uh, Bogotá. Some historians say that he wasn't doing anything nefarious down there. <laughs> but I think he was killing people. I think he was absolutely... Well, no, but, well actually, I, a bunch of leftists from all of Latin America went to Colombia in 1948, okay? And they wanted to overthrow the, the government there because they were back in the, the communist government. And Castro went there. And he escaped because in those days there was democracy. He went into the Cuban embassy. <laughs> and then the Cuban embassy later on sent it back to Cuba, otherwise he would have gotten killed in there, see. Uh, following the assassination of Jorge Eliezer Gaitan, left-wing liberal leader, the setting of the Ninth International Conference of American States, trying to solve Latin American economy and forge mutual defense against communism, flares into violence. The body of the assassin is dragged through the streets, kicked and beaten into a bloody mass of unrecognizable humanity. Rioters armed with rocks, bombs, and machetes storm through the city, sacking national buildings while governments call home conference delegates. Through the howling disturbance, Secretary of State George Marshall remained on the scene to resume the interrupted parley. How could you possibly, 1948, who, who is alive that could probably, you see, no, I mean, that, that he went there to back the people that were trying to overthrow the government, you know, it's called the Bogotá, Bogotá is the capital, the, you know, uh, it's no doubt about it, okay? And then later on, he... Nice meeting you. Nice to meet you. L later on, he, he, he killed himself, everybody know, a, a student okay. leader in Havana called uh, Manolo Castro. The name same, but he's not related to him. He, know, he knew that the people, the people knew that Castro was a gangster, okay? My, my family, my father couldn't stand him so, but I'm not saying Batista got to the point that oh, no one could stand it, even the upper classes this. He put it in the book, in 1958, uh, the Catholic people, you know, my uncle was vice president of the Catholic Association, they, they set aside one, one dollar for every head of cattle that was killed to be given to Castro. 
and the sugar people said one dollar for every uh, 300 pounds of sugar the bags were you know, to be used. So customers was taking more money <laughs> in the mountains than the gourmet, you see. So uh, that was the last uh, maybe hundred and half, half a year, you know. So, uh, so that's when, once the upper classes, the money people decided to to do that, then, you know, there was no way that Batista could have stayed there, you see. But, I mean, that was totally corrupt. That's, it's surprising that the upper class kind of supported him initially. In Cuba, by law, is in the book, that you have to be taught civic and history by a Cuban born. So, uh, Brother Wilfredo was in charge of the Hebrew remembrance of 10, March 10, 1952, with the good of time, said, this is a very sad day for Cuba. We, you know, so everybody that uh, had common sense knew that there was really, really, really bad for Cuba. And the upper classes, my family, I guess, they went alone. You know. uh, the economy was good, you know. Uh, and initially, the Baptista said, oh, we're going to have an election in 18 days. And the upper classes, well, they do not want, they want security and so on, uh, anywhere. So they went along. But once uh, the first student got killed in Havana in 1954, his name was Ruben Batista, no, no uh, connection to the president, and uh, once, then I remember my father said, look, I mean, uh, you know, we just don't like government to kill people, so they, you know, start going to the film, you see. And Castro created the, he attacked the Moncada regiment in, in, in Santiago on the 26th of July, 1953, and uh, there is the Archbishop there, save his life. You know, shoot him, and, uh, and so he's lucky. You know, and, uh, I wonder how the Archbishop felt later. <laughs> he was a Spanish. He was from Spain, so they sent him to Spain. Oh, wow. Um, I guess, so in the lead up to the Bay of Pigs, I've, I've kind of tracked it out in my head, the beginning. There were people that were, went in as advanced parties months before. Uh, Not n months before, I have it in the book, because there is a fellow that was supposed to be in charge of this uh, for the CIA in, in, in Havana, the second, Manuel Guillo, and uh, he wanted me to go with him. Uh, uh, but the CIA said no, because I didn't have training, so... I would think that, that uh, prior to the Bay of Pigs, I don't think we sent anybody there prior to, to 1961. There, okay. uh, probably December, January, but uh, not before that. There was a record, uh, not CIA, but it was anti-Castro guerrillas. Oh, oh, that's a different issue. Oh, yeah, that's in, that's in the, and that's in the book, too. But the CIA was dropping weapon supplies to them. Well, no. The weapon supply were dropped from Retaleo Air Base, where we got training. And we got very close to the American... By the way, they had never seen so many educated people <laughs> trained by them. So they were dropping even water in there. And then two weeks before we were supposed to go to Cuba, they stopped everything one day we went because we, the parts were going there to jump, do practice jump, you see. And we asked, they said no. The, and then some of the CIA, some of the CIA fellows told us, well, we, you're going to Cuba, so we don't want you to have uh, uh, people against you. Traditionally, um, guerrillas and so on are very nationalistic. You see, so uh, it is a fact. They right. just, the two weeks before, they used to all supplies to the people in, in, in the mountains in Trinidad.
prior to the Bay of Pigs, I believe the day before, uh, Higilio Nino Diaz. Nino Diaz. He landed on the opposite end of the island. No, no, no. Nino Diaz was supposed to take uh, the 180 people to land in Oriente province. That's the Oriente province. Is the right here? Castro. That's where he had Nino. Diaz. But he never. He, he didn't even land it. Didn't even land. No, where did he land? Did he land at all? No, he didn't land at all because Castro, Raúl Castro was in charge here, and, and boy, they told him not to land because there was no way. And, and, and the thing is that I think the CIA made the decision of that because they knew the moment we landed in Cuba, we knew that we were already lost. The Pentagon, the CIA knew that when we stopped the, the, the bombing, there was no chance that we could win. So they didn't want two armies. So to they didn't want. So no, no, they not, they did not uh, you know. Well, prior to uh, his attempted landing, or that, that plan, uh -huh. a Cuban Air Force plane was doing reconnaissance near Guantanamo Bay. Right. Yeah. And they say it crashed, but it was clear skies. Do you think maybe the U.S. military shot that plane down? Mm. Oh, no, no. Under Kennedy, my gosh. Kennedy, Kennedy was so, so afraid of the, of the Russians that they would take over Iran in those days if we were to do something. Oh. And Kennedy was uh, a liberal. And they said, in America, we thank him because he did so much great because of the civil rights situation. But in foreign affairs, he just, uh, my gosh, we had the Bay of Pigs and then Vietnam. He's the one that put 25,000 unquote advisors there in Vietnam. And the goal told him, don't, don't do that. <laughs> you see, so the two worst mistakes, the worst mistake that America made is Vietnam, okay? Then the second was the island of Cuba. So you think the plane, because uh, I had read that the Alabama National Guard was also involved in several of their Right, plans. because all the pilots came from the, uh, the, from the Alabama National Guard, the CIA has contracted pilots from there. They were supposed to go there to train our pilots. So we had, a, we had, my gosh, we had 30 some Cuban pilots. So your plan was to take an airstrip and... To, uh, take an airstrip right here. Okay, you see, this is the Bay of Pigs, and there is a little um, airplane, I mean, base in there. And the plan was for our planes to go there once there is no Castro planes. And naturally, then they would help us, you know, bomb, whatever, you see, and, and so on. Uh, but there was no thought whatsoever that, that American pilot would go there and three of them went in planes and they were shut down, you see. I've read people who say that Adlai Stevenson... Oh, he's the one that, he's the one that just caused us to go down. Do you think, because he was uh, walking in London and he had a massive heart attack, do you think that was natural or do you think maybe... Well, I don't want to go into those disputes. <laughs> the, the thing is that you see, in those days, and we still have it, but not that much, we have a rivalry between the CIA, the State Department, you know, and so on. And the CIA did not communicate and let the State Department know things. See, so Stevenson looked like a fool at the United Nations because one of our planes was damaged and he landed uh, in Key West or somewhere and he... The, he was instructed to say, I'm asking for political asylum. I'm a pilot from Castro. So, so Stevenson went to the United Nations <clears throat> and said, some of your pilots are defecting and so on. And, uh, he was not aware of what Cuban army pilots opened the first phase of organized revolt with bombing raids on three military bases. Two of the B-26 light bombers then seek asylum in Florida. On the heels of the air raids, Landings were affected by rebels at several places on the Cuban coast, and the rebellion against the red-tinged dictator was on. So he looked like a total fool when then Roa, who was the uh, uh, minister of, uh, 
of affairs for, for Cuba. He said, proof that that fellow is that you're totally lying in front of me. Meanwhile, at the United Nations, Cuban Foreign Minister Roa accused the United States of unleashing a war of invasion. Roa says the invading soldiers trained in Florida. But Ambassador Stevenson makes a quick denial. I'm sorry too, Dimitri. I'm very sorry. All right, you're sorrier than I am. But I am sorry as well. I am as sorry as you are, Dimitri. Don't say that you're more sorry than I am, because I'm capable of being just as sorry as you are. So we're both sorry, all right? All right. So Stevenson went to the White, to the White House and told uh, Kennedy, I demand that you stop the bombing. If, if not, I resign. And that's where Kennedy, he would have had. He was able well, fine, resign, but that's right then and there, we lost. So, if you were to blame one person for the failure, it would I'd be. Like to see you. Uh, I guess I have I have a couple more questions about uh, our time. Prior to uh, his time in Brigade Twenty Five Hundred Six, he was appointed to the second in command of the National Agrarian Reform Institute. Who is that? Manuel Artemi. Okay, Ar Artemi. Sorry, I've been pronouncing his name wrong the whole time. Uh, but there seems to have been some kind of a coup within the Agrarian Reform Institute. They had a militia. No, 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 no. Uh, Artemis, Artemis was very, very low in the Castro affair. Artemis was in Manzanillo here. He was in charge of the Agrarian Reform just in here. That's all he was. Okay, but Artemis was not a communist. No, he knew there was, and then one day he left. In December 1958, Manuel Artime joined with Castro's rebels and fought in the mountains of eastern Cuba. Having distinguished himself, he was appointed to a post in the second command of the Cerro Redondo district of INRA, which aimed to reform agriculture. Although this may sound like a prestigious job, it was more of a local one. However, it seems like there was a movement within the Reform Institute to oppose Castro. The Minister of Agriculture, Major Humberto Marin, and Rogelio Corzo, as Director of Agriculture, created the Rural Commandos with Artime's help. While this group would appear pro-Castro on the surface, it was composed mainly of students from the University Catholic Group. The core of the rural commandos would be used to build the Movement for Revolutionary Recovery and thus recruits for Brigade 2506. On March 13, 1961, a month before the Bay of Pigs invasion, Major Marine and four others landed here at Fundora Point near Havana with guns and explosives. Over the next few days, these rebels under Minister Marine teamed up with Director Corzo and traveled across the island to Siboni. They held a secret meeting with a group called the Front for Revolutionary Unity, but the meeting was raided by Cuban intelligence agents thanks to a spy. The men were held for a time and executed shortly after the invasion. He was appointed by two men who were not communists to the regional commander of that agrarian reform Right, but, but you see, the problem is, see, in 1959, when Castro take over, the entire cabinet were people beyond reproach was the best that Cuba can, can, can have in the government. And he did that on purpose so that then, actually our government recognized uh, uh, not Castro, he was, not, he was just head of the army. So they recognized the new government within a week or two. You see, it took, but the government, like 60 or 90 days, recognized Batista. But what I'm saying, because of the cabinet, Castro, unquote, was head of the army, that's all. And when he came to America, he was still head of the army. These, uh, uh Artime, the group you led at the time. M MRR, yeah, I belong to the MRR for a while. Uh, I believe they also called themselves the Rural Commandos, was that? Well, no, that was, that was here when they were here. Then. That disappeared once uh, once it went about. It. But Artemi became the, the boy, the CIA boy. I mean, they liked it. The CIA liked him. He was working with uh, Humberto Marin and Rogelio Corzo. Well, uh, Marin was the head of the of the agrarian reform, and Castro had him shot one day after the Bay of Pigs. Even Castro thought they were going to lose, so he got a few people shot just to be sure that. They, they couldn't get... 
Uh, oh, and, and I actually did take a note. Uh, Corzo led the uh, MRR. Uh -huh. I'm wondering, uh, can you explain their aims and what they would do, their, their ideology, especially what they believed in? Well, Octavia was in prison with us. He wasn't, he wasn't very big. He's the only civilian that went there. I guess Jimmy was like, I am a, a, a sort of liberal people, but not anti-communist. It's as simple as that. They've managed a certain amount of agrarian reform and so on. I didn't see anything wrong with that. Oh, uh, while the head of the Agrarian Reform Institute was in prison, so, sorry, Marine, yes. there was a man named Aldo Vera. Aldo Vera, yes, I know. Uh, he attempted to rescue him, but he was assassinated years later in Puerto Rico, and there's been a lot of questions over what happened to him. Do you know? Yeah, but those are things that, you know, I, I don't have any... Ancient history? Were, you know, but, uh, were there ever any rumors? I mean... No. Uh, I'm mean, saying this. Uh, Castro is, uh, is a genius. For example, one fellow that, that got shot at the Bay of Peaks was a sergeant that uh, we got uh, a few people that were communists that were arrested because they had killed people. They were helping Batista. And he and the captain are the one that shot them and actually uh, in prison. You cannot do that. So they allowed them to go into prison, uh, to get out of to Miami, the, the captain. So he went into the Bay of Peace. He told me, he said, look, you know, the captain is the one that ordered me to shoot the people. So uh, the captain was a spy. So Castro stayed here. I don't know what happened. But the, the sergeant went into the Bay of Peace and they got him um, uh, on the firing squad because they, they didn't want him to, to tell the truth over that. The specific incident I'm referring to here is the El Encantado fire. Remember, the main figures in prison at this point, a month before the Bay of Pigs, are the upper leadership of the Ministry of Agriculture, Major Marine, Rogelio Corzo, and handfuls of others who had joined their new group, the Front for Revolutionary Unity. Aldo Vera Serafin was a member of this group, formerly one of Castro's most trusted police officers. Upon learning that Marine was in prison, the FRU was likely dead in the water, and believing that his boss's invasion was was thwarted, he embarked on a campaign of hit-and-run style attacks designed to weaken the communist Cubans. He hoped to strike while the iron was hot, freeing Sori Marin and his comrades. One of these attacks was less than a week before the Bay of Pigs invasion. At 7 p.m. on the 13th, two incendiary devices detonated and Faye de Valle would be overcome by smoke and perish in the fire. She was one of the founders of the National Revolutionary Militias and was head of the store after it was nationalized by Castro. After the attack, police in plain clothes watched the beach and observed lights flashing from one of the windows towards the sea. Police raided the home and arrested Carlos Gonzalez Vidal, an employee of the store. Probably under torture, he confessed that CIA agent Jorge Camellas had infiltrated the island and was handing C4 out to saboteurs. He claimed he had been given these explosives and packs of cigarettes and had intended them to detonate after Duvalier had left. He was then to make his way to the beach and escape in a CIA speedboat. Unfortunately, after the Bay of Pigs, Cuban prisons swelled with anyone who had ever opposed Castro. The communists used it as an excuse to purge the island and immediately executed not only Vidal, but Marine, Corzo, and everyone else they felt like. In addition, it must also be pointed out that these groups had little, if any, idea that a full invasion was to take place only days later, and these sabotage actions were encouraged by the CIA as a way to divert police attention in its wake. Serafin escaped the island and would become the prime suspect of several bombings in Puerto Rico. On that island, he founded a new Cuban exile group, the Fourth Republic of Cuba, and campaigned for Puerto Rican independence. My own personal theory is that Castro's intelligence agents had left-wing Puerto Rican separatists kill him, as they were very active at at the time and interested in quartering the market for independence activism. One of the things that I'm interested in is um, it seems like Castro killed several people that were close to him that were communists. Uh, Camilo uh, Cienfuegos. Oh, Camilo Cienfuegos. He's uh, right here. Yeah. 
Do you think that Castro killed him? Well, definitely. Because uh, I know, I know, I even know where he's buried. You know, you see in Fuegos. Yeah. Where? See, but it happened because <laughs> you see, my friend, the one that used to be in charge of the firing squad, uh, he was arrested with Matos. Uh, Huber Matos. Yeah, that he were there, and then uh, Camilo went to. Over Matos, he was, I put it in the book, uh, he's a Jacobin, but he was not a communist. And uh, when he saw the, uh, he said, look, I just want to resign. And he told Camilo, that was head of the army at that time, said, look, we just want to resign. We don't want to be part of this, and that's it. I'll become a teacher again. And Camilo assured them, said, okay, let me take you to Havana, and you see, and then but he went back to Havana to the presidential palace, okay? He had a meeting there that was a Che, Raul, Fidel, and he. And the way I have it, Raul Castro is the one that shot Fidel right there. They put him in a plane, small plane. They took him to Camagüey. They landed in Camagüey. People saw Camilo there, which is dead, okay, and the pilot. And the plane disappeared, and the rumors was that there is uh, like maybe 70 miles from Camagüey, there was a, um, a ranch that was taken over by, by Castro, but it belonged to somebody that uh, was powerful before or whatever. The rumor was that they had already dug with bulldozer, a big hole, and they put the plane and Camilo there, and that was it. So then they created the, the thing of looking for Camilo all over the place, and I mean, what I'm saying is, see, the fellow was here, that's the city I'm from, in Camagüey, and they, they come to, in, order, in order to go to Havana, there's no way for you yeah. to disappear, okay? So then Castro went on television and said, well, no, uh, and then, I mean, they, I mean, those people are so bright. So two weeks afterward, Raul disappeared. You see, I mean, you know, and they disappeared at the swamps in here, the, all the helicopter, you know, they hit him for four, five, just to maintain. But then once Camilo disappeared within a week, his three assistants that were captains, they went into... Uh, the fort in Havana, and they were accidentally shot. All of them. You see. That's one week after Camilo disappeared. And then I, I learned all that because of what I, I went to the when they were uh, when Marcos and all of the other officers uh, were put on the thing, and uh, Raúl Castro came to attack them. And uh, it happened, it was on a Saturday, I was on the account and went there, I saw my friend and I told him, look, this is the thing that really happened. Would you be able to show me on a map where the ranch is, where... Well, no, not really, because it's... Uh, uh, see, Camagüey is here, and they... I mean, it's like 60 or 70 miles someplace in there, but I, I, even the, the name, I forgot the name that they told me, but I mean... At that point of aim, it's a speculation if it was buried here or there, or that the plane disappeared. And take a look, you know, this is come away. I mean, the plane goes straight. I mean, uh, there's no way. They died out at sea, which is, you know. Uh, disappeared, okay, from it. But they wanted to kill him because of, uh, he, he said, no, I, I gave them my word that they were going to uh, take them out of the, uh, the air. It's fascinating because I had all these questions about his disappearance. It seems like Fidel was worried that Che and Camilo were going to... No, 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 she, no, no, she was there. She was total Marxist. She, she was there at the presidential palace the day that Camilo, I, Camilo disappeared. I have read that Che being killed in Bolivia was something that Castro was okay with. Well, because Che is so Marxist, that he wanted to create a revolution everywhere. She went to Africa and so on, you see. His principles were... were right. More I mean, than uh, uh, Fidel, Fidel was... He wanted power, okay? And he really gained power. So 
they get to the point because he criticizes Fidel and so on, and basically they told him either you, either you leave or you, you die here too, you see. So then he went to first to Africa and, uh, and the Congo and so on, and then from there he went to uh, Bolivia, and in Bolivia, one uh, captain that was a student uh, came away, naturally dying there, but uh, uh, no, no. Uh, she was a total Marxist, okay? I mean, Marxist from day one. Castro was a Marxist Leninist intellectually and so on, but Castro was, was power. And he got power, you see. I, I had just heard that he had cancer and people were questioning whether or not he actually died of cancer. Speculation and I have like that, that I, I I just don't know if it was uh, if it was uh, well, true or not that he got killed or he died from cancer. You see, he was young. I mean, uh, uh, twenty eight. He must have been thirty three, thirty four when he died. I mean, you know. but you mentioned Nicaragua. Were there rumors that maybe he was in Nicaragua? Well, well no, he was in Nicaragua when he died. Yeah. Oh, okay. I, I had been under the impression that maybe he died in Miami, but I was no, thinking... No, no. Uh, no, no, he died in Nicaragua. I might be confusing that with uh, Pepe San Roman. Oh, San Roman. That's the head of the... San Roman, no, San Roman committed suicide in Houston. He was the head of the... A heck of a man, and I, I have had respect for him. Uh, the look on his face, he looks like a very... Oh, a one. ...tough person. See, tough San Roman affair. committed suicide because he fell that he was responsible for losing the baby pigs. Now, now his second in command, Oliva, which uh, I guess, you know, uh, Oliva went to Forbidden and became a general. San Roman, once he was invited by Robert Kennedy to his ranch there in Virginia and riding horses with him a number of times, he knew that they were using them so as to neutralize the Cubans. Uh, he didn't even go to Fort Benning. I, I didn't go to Fort Benning, but I didn't, I could not uh, accept uh, what, what Kennedy did. He did something illegal. You cannot make people that are not citizens officers of the American Army. I, I saw that. I was wondering what... <laughs> um, I took a note here just to ask you about uh, Omega-7, Alpha-66. Mm. Um, you said you were a member of Alpha-66. Alpha-66, but not Omega. Omega is... See, my friend, like here in the book, Dionysius was the, in charge of uh, Alpha-66, and he's the one that got the foreign affairs minister for in Chile, uh, got they killed him in, in Washington when Reagan was the president. They blew up his car. And through Alpha 66? No, Omega. Oh, that was Omega. That was, um... Pe oh, uh, I've heard Pelletier. Bosch. Huh? Was Bosch behind that? I thought that... Well, they accused Bosch of being dead, but uh, uh, the, the FBI accused uh, uh, my friend Bombing they they basuk uh, the Polish uh, oh, ship in uh, I had heard of him. So when they when they actually killed it was Pelletier the name of the foreign affairs in charge of Allende in Chile. Uh, when that happened uh, <laughs> went on the ground too. They finally caught him in Puerto Rico and then put him in jail. But he's, uh, he was on the Reagan, so um, he he stayed in jail. He's in Miami now, I think. In the last couple of days, I've actually been approached by somebody who claims to know the current leadership of Alpha 66. Well, honestly, once Nazario Sarhen died and so on, I mean, there is nothing left in Miami. I mean, I mean, you know, it's just a few elderly people. You know, there's nothing that can be done. One of the things I heard that was a final nail in the coffin was there's this man, Rodolfo Frometa. 
that broke off a bunch of guys from 66. Right, indeed. But that's, that's 10, 15 years ago or so, not, not yesterday or today. Yeah. Juan Jose Perriero. Mm -hmm. What are your, I know him yet. He what are your very thoughts? Big. What are your thoughts on him? Huh? Uh, what are your thoughts on him and his uh, 1977 death? I don't have. I, I, you know, I. Uh, Perrier was pro Batista, huh? fairly pro Batista. So you think? I, I I hate to put words in your mouth, but. Do you think that the Bay of Pigs veterans might have had some infighting after they got back? No, 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 no. But honestly, God, I mean, you know, uh, uh, boy, when we went there, I mean, I, as a matter of fact, one soldier, Batista, uh, challenged me to a duel, and I had to go into the uh, to the firing fellow there in Guatemala. Uh, if it would have been for Pito Pino, who is my commander, that. Stop us! I would have to either kill him or kill me because you know. The, the, oh, that was. But all that stopped after. All 61. that once, like once we went to prison. I, I remember that I was sick one time. We didn't have food, and I don't know what the fellow that was, at least the fellow. I, mean, I was young, and he was maybe 15 years older than me. I don't know where he got some sort of soup and gave me the soup, and I was extremely grateful for that. I mean, honestly, once. We forgot. I mean, uh, uh, no, there was no more Batista or revolutionary people. Um, Emilio Milian, he arrived in Florida after the Bay of Pigs. He was a critic of Castro and sectarianism. And a year before Perriero died, uh -huh. he suffered a car bombing. Perriero warned, uh, was warned. Basically, the, the idea is that Emilio Milian warned Perriero to stay out of politics. And then Perriero is assassinated. I forget the details of the assassination. But well, they're right that in those days, they assassinated two or three people that belonged to Batista, too, you see. Uh, so, uh, from... The, the name of one of the fellows was famous, you know. Uh, and they tried to kill two or three of the, <laughs> like my friend in there too, that, uh, that he was in the firing squad, you see. So, uh, that, but, but after the Bay of Peaks, you know, uh, boy, we honestly, uh, you know, that's good, we found an enemy, and it was Castro totally, you know, not uh, pro Batista against Batista, and so on. But, there were some people that I don't see why in the world did they find in Batista. Well, in, um, in October of the year that Perriero was killed, uh, Carlos River Collado claimed that Castro had killed Perriero, Rolando Maspero, and Jose uh, Elias. Oh, Maspero was my guy. He was a... Uh, I just don't know... Some of those people were killed by Castro, I mean, Castro's army, you know, my God, I see. Master uh, uh, was Castro's enemy for years and years, okay, I mean, Master was very powerful in the Bautista, you see, so... Uh, but he was communist before he was pro right, yeah, 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 yeah. So, uh, Rolando Maferrer, boy, <laughs> so... I, I just don't know. I, uh, those are crimes in Miami that we never uh, saw the same for one reason or another one, you see. Dr. Rolando Masferrer left his home here in the early morning hours of October 31st, 1975, turning the keys to his ignition, a car bomb placed under his vehicle exploded, claiming his life. Immediately a group calling itself Zero came forward and claimed responsibility for the assassination, as well as for the targeted killing of Jose Elias de la Torriente one year prior. Now this group claimed to be acting on behalf of Fidel Castro, and it claimed it was a communist insurrectionary group. However, people began to wonder who had actually killed
both of these men, because they both had enemies in both camps. For example, Mass Ferrer was very well known as a communist fighter in the Spanish Civil War, and upon returning had fought tooth and nail for Cuban dictator Batista. On top of that, he had also befriended Santo Traficante and Jimmy Hoffa, and was a very well-known loan shark, sending money to what he called the 30th of November organization, which aimed to assassinate Fidel Castro. He had also sent boats to the island, in which was an utter failure. So a lot of people could have blamed him, even though he had a very, very vested interest in killing Fidel Castro. On top of that, the other man that was assassinated that was claimed by the Group Zero, Jose Elias de la Torriente, was an elderly financier of these sorts of operations, and he had put forward a plan called Plan Torriente, which entailed military actions and sabotage on the island. When he eventually assessed this plan as no longer viable because Cuban security had been upgraded to the point where they knew that it would be a suicide mission, he was also assassinated. So people began to conjecture. Was this the act of a communist insurrectionary group, or was it the act of the CIA, of other Cuban exile politicians, of other militants? And it was really unknown until a defector from Cuba came forward in their intelligence community and did claim that at least as far as Masfero the Tiger is concerned, he was killed on orders of Fidel Castro and the hit was carried out by a colonel. Did you ever meet Rolando? No, 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 it wasn't my fire. I would have never, ever. Because, you know, he was a pro Batista. I would have never met that fellow. He seems like he probably would have. I mean, being communist and pro-Batista, and when he fought for the communists in Spain, he was the enforcer. He would beat people. Oh, no, no, no. The man was no good at all, okay? Batista got himself surrounded by people that wanted to gosh. Well, uh, it was Maspero who, I mentioned earlier the uh, advance guys mm -hmm. in Cuba weeks before it, he uh, brought four boats to Cuba months before the Bay of Pigs, Mas Ferrer. Mas Ferrer. And only one made it, and there were several Americans on it. Alan Thompson, Anthony Zarba, and Robert Fuller. But you, you had done your research. These guys... So you've got a communist pro-Batista agent entering Cuba months before with Americans on the boats... It seems like the CIA was doing something over here while they were doing Bay of Pigs. Well, see, there is something that the CIA was doing the, the 25 or 6 and so on, but that was groups in Miami that had money because we had some Cubans that had money. And uh, they were doing things uh, against Castro outside of the CIA thing. That, that's a fact, yeah. Haitian priest, Father Jean-Baptiste Georges, reportedly raised $350,000 for the venture and was slated to replace Francois Duvalier as president of Haiti. The mission never got off the ground. According to some reports, the king said no, and because this man, Rolando Masferrar, had a falling out with another Cuban exile, concluded that it is most appropriate to postpone our part in the plan. Well, how did your men feel when they heard that announcement? Very depressed, I have to state, because they were ready and they are still ready and willing to help the Haitian people, uh, not only because they are very much uh, sensitive to the suffering of the Haitian people in the hands of a madman who's uh, Papa Doc Duvalier, but also because up to now, everybody believes, anybody with a... Uh, some uh, political capability to analyze the international situation and the limitation of the United States through their agreements that the only way to get into Cuba passes through Haiti, through Port-au-Prince. So Master Air was yeah. probably just something... Right, the CIA no, would not have given him a nickel. And that would explain why they stopped dropping arms into the mountains. Right. Um, so, apparently, Thompson, Zarba, and Fuller were executed in Cuba. Uh -huh, right. Does anyone know what their ties were? Were they CIA? Were they just patriots? Or No, uh, that I can't the, the story is just filled with mysterious yeah. people. Um, Castro actually went on the media, and I don't trust a word of what he says, but he claims Mesfer 
had a paramilitary called the Tigers of Mass Bearer. <laughs> Los Tigres, yeah, but, the, <laughs> but it was, Los Tigres de Mass Bearer was even, uh, when Batista was in power, he, he had the, uh, these Tigres, uh, uh, reminds me a little bit of the Russian film uh, that he has those uh, people in Ukraine and so on that got killed the other day. <laughs> That's oh, the uh, the Wagner guys. <laughs> right, yeah. Oh. It, it reminds me very well. <laughs> so they said. existed. They were real. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Castro said they killed 2,000 people. Well, Castro exaggerated everything. One day he went on, on television in early said, because we got 1,000, 10,000, 20,000 killed <laughs> by Batista. I mean, he, uh, uh, he stopped at 20, he could have kept on going, and we have figured out, I don't think that Batista, if Batista killed 5,000 people, I don't think that would have been more than, you know, yes, uh, you know. Only days after the assassination of Rolando Maspero here in his Miami home, the death of Arturo Rodriguez Vives would be discovered by his wife in their New York-based apartment. Zero came forward and claimed responsibility for this assassination as well. And then a unusual character named Roberto Domecq comes forward. Roberto was seen fleeing the murder of Afro-Cuban voodoo practitioner Juan Oliver Hernandez. It seems like Roberto was an unhinged figure, but was employed periodically by Cuban exile militants. And he had filed a report with the police about Oliver Hernandez, claiming that Hernandez threatened to slit his throat for some sort of a voodoo ritual. When he was taken in by police, he claimed that he had been paid by Cuban exile leaders to kill De La Torriente because Torriente had betrayed their plans. He also claimed to have information on the killing of Mass Ferrer, but this never came forward, and he was sentenced to 20 years in prison. And a little bit more background on Rolando Masferrer's activities here in South Florida. In late September 1960, Rolando sent four boats to Cuba, hinting at CIA involvement, or at least the involvement of some pretty elite private businesses. The one boat to reach the island contained U.S. citizens Alan D. Thompson, Anthony Zarba, and Robert O. Fuller. All three men were executed on orders of Fidel Castro. In December 1960, the Miami Herald reported that Rolando was training 53 mercenaries at the mansion of Howard Hughes and was spreading info through a New York-based Spanish-language newspaper, possibly a connection to business dealings in that state. He met JFK sometime in 1961, but Kennedy never met with him again. He was just too radical. In 67, he amassed a stockpile and planned to invade Haiti with his soldiers of fortune. This operation was called either Project Nassau or Project Istanbul, and Cuban naval forces foiled their plots to land at the beachhead. From 1970 to 72, he was in a U.S. prison. His murder occurred in 1975, apparently on orders from Fidel Castro himself, and carried out by Department Q of the Cuban Intelligence Services. Nowadays, the assassination of Jose de la Torriente is mostly forgotten, or at most used as a historic footnote to tell the story of other people that were assassinated in the Miami area during the Cold War. But when I asked about his grave location in the cemetery office, the man telling me was immediately very interested because apparently his grandmother used to make small donations, $10 here, $15 there, to Torriente's business because it was being used in the fight for a free Cuba. And he was killed by an assassin's bullet, a sniper, who took a shot at him as he was watching TV one evening through his living room window. This happened right next to his wife, Gilda. Now, what is interesting about these assassinations is that it could have been done, of course, by Castro, and probably was, but Del Torriente and men like Rolando Masferrer had upset the mainstream Cuban exile community. In fact, in the months leading up to it, De La Torriente was accused of spending more money on his construction business than he was to plan Torriente and the invasion and agitation of Cuba by private business interests, which was Plan Torriente. So, he was killed oddly enough, by a different method as Rolando Masfer. And you'd think that if Cuban intelligence services were going to kill somebody with a car bomb, which, again, I think they did, they would probably keep that M.O., at least if they used a terror group, Zero, in order to accomplish this. But the fact that they were killed by separate methods, it's interesting, it's unusual. At a later date, um, you had these two Americans, and this is what I'm interested in as a member of the POW Investigative Project, 
There's theories that they might have lived a long time. Alexander Rourke and Geoffrey Sullivan, they met Frank Sturgis, <laughs> who later claimed Alex Rourke had a, B a B-25 bomber in Nicaragua and they wanted to use it. The two left, they left Sturgis behind at the airport and they left with an unknown man in their plane. Uh -huh. uh, they flew back to the airport three times and were told not to land on the final approach to the airport and reports say they might have landed in Cuba, but no one knows. Have you heard, because people say, oh, I was a prisoner in Cuba in the early 1960s. I saw Alexander Rourke and, and Jeffrey Sullivan. Have you ever heard of the two Americans that might have been imprisoned? No, not really. Because uh, I believe it was Rourke who, the CIA said, stop bombing Cuba. Stop sending supplies to Cuba. Do it secretly. But what, what year did you think that was? 63? Maybe? Well, my Rourke got killed in 60... Early 63... Maybe early 64 or so. Alexander Douglas Rourke. He was killed down in Cuba. You see. I mentioned as a part of that Frank Sturgis, as part of Operation 40, and very little is known publicly about Op 40. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about, were you ever involved in Operation no, 40? No, no, no. Did you hear rumors of it? No, you see, what, what happened when I, uh, when I left Miami in 63, came to America uh, for a few years, I had to take care of my family and so on. Mm, so yeah, I, you had a child. Yeah, so I was really out of the thing until 1980 <clears throat> with Maria Castro that then again we start getting involved in things you see. And uh, so I suppose the, the last couple of questions is uh, could you just uh, I feel like these have all been questions around the Bay of Pigs but can you describe what it was like in the Bay of Pigs? Well since I wasn't Castro's, well, not army, but I mean, the military academy and training the future officers of his uh, militia. Uh, I, honestly, I could not see. I could not see us. I mean, he has so many thousands of people, I could not see us. When I got there, it was 550, but then it became 1,200 or 1,400. Uh, as a matter of fact, a little battalion was kept in, in, in Guatemala because they knew <laughs> there was a waste. So I, I can see, I can see uh, how could we defeat uh, Castro's army. I, I couldn't, you know. But again, it was the mighty United States. I mean, my gosh, you see. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, and actually, our history has been great until 1945. After 1945, we haven't done that good. In Korea, okay, we didn't do that good. In Vietnam, my gosh, it was a disaster. So uh, the only thing we've done is uh, Reagan and the little island in there and <laughs> Bush uh, in there with, uh, with Iraq. But, you know, we didn't do that good for many, many years, you see. So, uh, honestly, I... Uh, then, then see, I was, I was fairly nationalistic, and I, I read history, and I knew Guatemala and so on, and our, our veins, and uh, and I saw that the, the, Vietnam, the CIA wanted to, to control Cuba the way they control Guatemala. Honestly, that's my opinion. Well, can you tell me? Uh, so, how, how did the invasion play out for you? So you landed. Not at the Bay of Pigs itself, but kind of as an advanced party. Well, sorry, I didn't even take, you see, this is the Bay of Pigs thing here, okay? The little white thing in here. So paratroopers landed here and here, here and here. They figured the first one were going to be overrun, and then the second one until the whole thing. But the problem is that Castro was saying, <laughs> like 40,000 people this way. I, I was on the 
with on the eastern side, which is a little bit the town here called San Blas, and in there it was not the fighting was not as bad in here. But what it happened that we were doing so well in here that we really were advancing. <laughs> and then they told us to stop the advance because, you know, Castro was almost getting here to the beach and we, uh, we were here. So they told us to stop and then they told us to go back to the beach, you know, which, which by the way, th that's incredible. I was here and I went back all the way to the beach and then Oliva, the second in command, gave me 14 or 15 paratroopers, told me to go to the mountains here, which is impossible. So I kept on going, and I got, I got caught here in a Wada de Pasajer walk. My uh, father-in-law has a ranch right here, so I figured, my gosh, I can walk four or five days in the evening, I can get there, you see, so, but they caught me here. So your plan was to go to your family's ranch? Uh, uh, right. You know. Do you think, uh, I, I read that you had your paratrooper boots on, that's what gave it away that you were... Right, that's what, you know, they, you know... Was there anybody that was not captured, that dressed in civilian clothes and then just... Well, I was in civilian clothes, totally. But I mean... Only you, with my boots, they, they, they saw me because of the boots, they knew that I was there. Was there anyone in the brigade who was never found? You know, he landed, he just went back to his family and never said anything? Well, there was a few people... What, what, you see, we were so, so outside the, the beach, here, we were here, so some people didn't go back like they were, were told, and they stayed there, okay? But it was the beginning of the swamp, so, so my gosh, it was so easy. There's a few people that, that did not go to prison, and then there are some people that stay in the swamp three or four too, that they waited in the swamp, and then Castro, at the end of uh, a week or two, he had to remove because it cost too much money to have 60,000 people in there, so, so they removed it. So there's a few people, uh, the number I think is less, uh, seven, eight, or ten, or something, that either because of San Blas or at the swamp that they stay there and, uh, until they, they left embassies and things like that. Six or seven people, right? But not many. So pretty much everybody that was alive after the invasion came back, right. left Cuba. Yes, yes. Except the hundred and so that.